Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. We're continuing in Isaiah. We're in Isaiah chapter 28. Let's begin in verse 14. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers. The therefore alludes to what was spoken in yesterday's devotion, quoted in 1 Corinthians 14, about the Lord speaking to his people with stammering speech in a foreign language, possibly alluding uh, alluding to the Akkadian language that was found in Assyria, Uh, these people would add on to the word of the Lord. They kept on adding on to the word of the Lord, line after line, a little here, a little there, and they would not listen to God. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers, who rule this people in Jerusalem. For you said, we have made a covenant with death. We made an agreement with Sheol. Right, if you're just listening to this, if you haven't seen this, death is actually capitalized as though it were a proper noun, as is Sheol. When the overwhelming catastrophe passes through, it will not touch us because we have made falsehood our refuge and have hidden behind treachery. Therefore, the Lord God said, look, I have laid a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. The one who believes will be unshakable, and I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the mason's level. Hail will sweep away the false refuge and water will flood your hiding place. Your covenant with death will be dissolved and your agreement with Sheol will not last. When the overwhelming catastrophe passes through, you will be trampled. Every time it passes through, it will carry you away. It will pass through every morning, every day, and every night. Only terror will cause you to understand the message. Indeed, the bed is too short to stretch out on, and its cover too small to wrap up in. For the Lord will rise up as he did at Mount Perizim. He will rise in wrath as at the valley of Gibeon to do his work, his unexpected work, to perform his task, his unfamiliar task. So now do not scoff or your shackles will become stronger. Indeed, I have heard from the Lord God of armies a decree of destruction for the whole land. So the people of Judah and uh, the people of the northern kingdom of Israel uh, would in this approaching discipline from God point to the covenants that they had made with death and Sheol, thinking that their treachery will have protected them from the coming wrath. For you said, we've made a covenant with death. We've made an agreement with Sheol. When the overwhelming catastrophe passes through, it won't touch us because we've made falsehood our refuge. This is imitated today even by Christians. If you have a ghost profile, a dummy profile, a fake online profile, you think that falsehood will be your refuge. You think that lying in a way that you can hold other people accountable for what they've done whilst evading accountability yourself by way of your refuge and your anonymity puts you squarely in the crosshairs of this warning. I don't have any dummy profiles. I don't have any. I put my name on everything I do. And that's so that I'm accountable to it. Because if I put something out that's bad or doctrinally inaccurate, it's on me. I've got to answer to the accountability structure, to the redemption church. So this word from the Lord, look, I've laid a stone in Zion, a tested stone, is exquisite. And it's quoted numerous times. This wording about the cornerstone appears in Matthew 21, 33 through 46. You can see a reference in Luke 20, 9 through 19, in Romans 9, uh, uh, 9, verse 30 through chapter 4, verse 4, uh, Romans chapter 10 as well, beginning in uh, uh, verses 9 through 13, and Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 31. The one who believes will be unshakable. You can see this prophecy echo Bible-wide. Uh, this is not actually even the first time this appears canonically, canonically or even chronologically within Scripture. The Psalms, I think, were the first to introduce this cornerstone language. The cornerstone is at the very edge of a building where two walls meet and it's load-bearing. When you walk through downtown Seattle, uh, you'll see these big giant stones that jut out from the edge of the building. And a lot of times that's where this placard is or where this engraving is to talk about the the, the completion of the building and when it was first built, uh, when it was completed. That's the cornerstone. 
architecturally, we just know that that's where a lot of the weight of the building goes. If you were to take that out, the structural integrity of the entire building would be compromised. I once did this in a sermon illustration, even had uh, big giant boxes built and, and took the corner one out. And uh, my hope was that the whole thing would come tumbling down because I had done that first at my church in Pensacola and it worked. The problem is that my team painted it with this sticky paint to make it look more like concrete and they did a great job, but it had an unexpected side effect in the, the, the stickiness of the paint caused the boxes to semi glue themselves together. <laughs> and so unfortunately in a passage that was dealing with, uh, dealing with false teachers, you know, uh, dealing with false teachers who would add on to the word of God, we had to put, I want to say like a stapler or something in the box above it because the stickiness of the paint caused it to stay upright. I took the cornerstone out and then nothing happened. And I was like, oh man, <laughs> we want, I want to be true to what the text says, and even in the illustration. So this il illustration of a cornerstone is a prophecy about Christ. He's the one who is discarded by the Pharisees, but he turns out to be the cornerstone. The way that you did construction was not by way of necessarily even carving stones to fit what you needed. You would just sort of go to the quarry and you would gather stones and you would use them in accordance with whatever you had. And if it came time to place the cornerstone, you wanted a big, strong, particularly, uh, you know, a, a particularly solid rock that would bear the weight of the whole building. They'd be like, this is our cornerstone. And Jesus conveys the Pharisees to the workers at the quarry or the construction site, looking at the stone and saying, nah, that one's worthless. But it turns out in the end, it actually, it's the cornerstone. That's how they viewed Jesus. Now, nah, can anything good come from Nazareth? He's a false teacher. He casts out demons by the power of Beelzebul. They would just dismiss Jesus. But in the end, he turns out to be the one upon whom everything rests. He's the cornerstone. He's the son of God. He's the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ, the Logos, the savior, the king. So don't dismiss Jesus. What you do with Jesus in your worldview affects your whole eternity. It's more important than who you marry. It's more important than your career path and your major. It's more important than your relationships. It's more important than your own sense of self-worth even. What you do in your worldview with Jesus is the most important thing in your entire life. You either dismiss him like the Pharisees did, and on judgment day, you come to see the truth that he's the cornerstone, or you place your faith in him. And as a result, you are unshakable. The one who believes will be unshakable. I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the mason's level. I right? see we're drawing again from the masonry imagery of the use of the cornerstone. Hail will sweep away the false refuge and water will flood your hiding place. Your covenant with death will be dissolved. So here he's going to he's going to harken back to some stuff that took place in Joshua chapter 10 and in 2 Samuel chapter 5 verse 20. This outpouring of God's discipline is going to come in a way that's unexpected. At Mount Perizim, we see that uh, referred to in verse 21, for the Lord will rise up as he did at Mount Perizim. This is a reference to 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 20. There's this bursting flood and God gave David uh, victory over the Philistines. And then there's this reference as well to Gibeon. We see that in, in verse 21 as well. He will rise in wrath as at the valley of Gibeon. See Joshua chapter 10, verse 11, this massive hailstorm came, this violent hailstorm uh, came to bring victory to the people of God. And it allowed, uh, it allowed Joshua to defeat these Canaanite cities uh, in, in the southern region. So those were unexpected. They're not without precedent. We've seen God use the waters of the flood, you know, uh, to bring even the original baptism of the Israelites and the washing away of of uh, the men of Pharaoh who are pursuing them. God has always had the authority to do this. Even since before creation began, it was said that he, that the spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. So Jesus walking on water, the baptism with water and the baptism by fire, the, uh, the turning of the water into wine, these all demonstrate God's lordship over water itself. And God can use the waters of the flood to discipline the whole earth as he did in the days of Noah. He can use the waters of the flood to, to wash away the, 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 the militant Egyptians uh, who were pursuant 
you know, uh, pursuing the, the, the Israelites. He could use it even in the form of the hail that destroyed the enemies of God at, um, at, at Gibeon. This is unexpected, but it's well within God's prerogative. He's the one who's Lord over the elements in the hydrological cycle. He can use all of these means as he will. So now do not scoff or your shackles will become stronger. This is a warning to the leadership, perhaps not only of Ephraim, uh, the largest tribe within the Northern Kingdom, but uh, to all the leadership of, of Israel in general, do not scoff or your shackles will become stronger. Indeed, I have heard from the Lord God of armies, a decree of destruction for the whole land. They made a deal with death and they thought it would save them. They used treacherous means to hide themselves and they thought they could get away with it. They made a deal with the devil, so to speak. They have an agreement with Sheol, according to verse 15. But this is absolute foolishness. It's absolute foolishness. I think that some of the most first-hand application of this text really pertains to those who are in positions of leadership who teach. This ought to hit us right between the eyes. It's a warning. Don't try to add on to the word of God and don't try to use treacherous means to protect yourself, right? Rather, put your name on it and say what God said. Say only what God said and be true to it, no matter how unpopular it may be. Don't try to use dubious means to guise, you know, what you've done to contort teachings, try to manipulate people to position yourself to benefit financially, for example, pastor. Rather, open up the books and be forthright, conduct yourself in a way that is above reproach. Don't try to add on to the word of God line by line. Be unshakable because everything comes back to Jesus. At the Redemption Church, we share the gospel every single week, regardless of the content of the text. This past weekend, we preached about God's wrath on Moab and Arabia and uh, this, this, this passage about God's discipline on Jerusalem. But even then, all of these passages would come back to a gospel presentation at the end. If you were watching online and it cut out, it's because the power to the theater suddenly just went out. So stay tuned. We're going to re-record some of that so you can hear the end of that sermon. But we always come back to Jesus, the cornerstone. We always come back to him because he's the ultimate fulfillment of everything. Every Old Testament passage ultimately leads to Jesus and Jesus alone. This one, Isaiah chapter 28, verses 14 through 22, especially is very clear. It's it's beautiful. It's talking about how this in this unexpected way, God's going to bring about deliverance. Don't scoff at it. God's been able to do unexpected things before, like he did at Perizim, like he did, uh, like he did at Gibeon. He's going to bring about a cornerstone. Look, I've laid a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. The one who believes will be unshakable. May you be absolutely unshakable, Christian, because your faith is in the cornerstone. Don't join in the mockers and the scoffers because their shackles will become stronger verse 22, but you will be unshakable because your faith is in the Logos, the Son of God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Prince of Peace, Jesus.